Oh man, this guy, uh... You remember when the village people sang in the Navy? Oh, I do remember that. So this is so much better than that. I'm just gonna say it because this guy was the Admiral. Uh, people... people call him the Admiral. Obviously, that's his nickname. Welcome, everybody, to the Sports Experience Podcast. I'm your co-host, Dom Tola, sitting alongside Chris Quinn, our other co-host. And today, we're going to get into a little NBA action. That's right. We're talking David Robinson, the man that I associate with the Spurs more than any other player. Even more than George Iceman Gervin or Tim Duncan. Yeah. This is like... Mr. Spur. And granted, both those guys are Hall of Famers. Yes. You know, I don't know if Duncan's in yet. I don't know if he's been retired for long enough. I think he I think he is, but he definitely will be. Um, regardless, this is the guy that almost saves the franchise in San Antonio. Absolutely. And everyone associates um the San Antonio Spurs with and honestly, my favorite NBA basketball player of all time. Yeah, I loved that little tidbit that you gave me right before we started this because he was such an iconic player for this era. He was. And this was an era which I always... And this is like the era I watched NBA basketball Me in. Me too. Where every um, team had a star. And this team in San Antonio had its star. And that was him. Well, and this is why I loved NBA at this point was the best teams had two stars. Uh, you know what I mean? And... Like we like we see now, the best teams have like four stars, and you're just like, all right. So they're... there's like three teams that'll probably yes, win this year, and... even without Jordan in the league, because obviously. But but that's why it was so exciting back then. Was like you had all these teams coming out of the West Coast with the Spurs and the Rockets and the Suns Sonics. And, and the Sonics. It was like every year you and the Jazz, who I hate, but every year yeah. it was just like so exciting. Yeah, because. Everyone was good. Everyone had a marketable asset on their team. And David Robinson was San Antonio's. Yep. Born August 6th, 1965. Uh, second child of Ambrose and Frida Robinson. His dad was actually in the Navy. Yep. Which uh, caused him to move around a lot. But they settled in uh, Woodbridge, Virginia. His dad was an engineer. And uh, David was always good at sports as a kid, but not basketball. Well, Which is odd. His story is so... Awesome. And this is why I feel like, and we were talking about before the podcast, he was 5'9 his junior year. Yes, 5'9, and we'll later explain how large he became. But And then he hits this growth spurt that a lot of guys hit, uh, you know, sophomore, junior year, high school, senior year of high school, and he gets up to like 6'6. Which... Most guys, when they hit that growth spurt, because I certainly did, I went from about like 5'6 to about 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, it's usually like three or four inches. Yep. This dude grows nine inches. Yeah, almost a foot. In in a year. Mm -hmm. And he's n really never played organized basketball. Before. That's what I love. He's never played organized basketball. He's never been to like basketball camps or anything like that. But the basketball coach of his high school was like, who is this six six man walking around our high school? He like I'm pretty yeah. sure he put his name on the list. Yeah, he was just like, well, he's tall. Let's see what he's got. Yeah, and hadn't played organized basketball at Osborne Park Osborne Park High School in Manassas, Virginia, but played in his senior season. Earns all area, all district. I mean, he's a legit player with. Almost zero. It's almost like the Didier Drogba yes. episode. Yes. It's just like. That's exactly what I was thinking. This just athletic person who's never done this seems to find his niche. And I found it so interesting. I saw an interview with him where he said it actually benefited him because of his personality that he wasn't like overwhelmed with basketball at a young age and almost yeah. like burnt out. Exactly. And that for because you kind of see that with some athletes where they're just like don't have the heart and he was like i was so excited to play basketball through my college and nba career because i didn't play it as a kid he's just like i'm here to have fun yes and the thing about david is you find out he gets an opportunity to play basketball in college and he's having fun, but he's also a really smart dude. Yes. Like, scores over 1,300 on his SATs, which 
even though he's not recruited heavily. That's what I found so interesting is that these bigger colleges didn't come in and recruit him, but I think it was because he literally had he one had zero year. experience. Yeah. yeah, that's honestly the only thing I can chalk it up to yeah. is that he, you know, he's an athletic dude because he played sports as a youngster, but it's like, oh, wow, now I'm suddenly 6'6 six, six and a decent height to play basketball. Exactly. And he gets to go to the United States Naval Academy. Well, this is what I found a little silly on the Naval Academy because, and I don't know how it is in other countries, but in the United States, the height requirement is six foot six because you can't fit on, on a ship, submarines, submarines, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So they have a height requirement and he's actually six, seven at this point, but they're pretty confident he's not going to grow again. Well, they're probably like he grew 10 inches. How much more can this gentleman actually go so they give him they give him a waiver because he really shouldn't be joining them or whatever no but, yeah, but, but they were like let's get this guy in it's like hey he plays basketball he's smart enough to become an officer yep he's one inch taller and he's grown already nine ten inches yes there's no way he can get any taller well over the next doesn't really happen this is what i found so interesting is over the next year two years he grows another three four inches yeah he's by his sophomore start of his sophomore year he's seven feet tall it's like the reverse lionel messi yes. where he's not even being drugged it's just like are you fucking kidding me what i bet hell? that's how these officers kept being like this is turning into a problem is is w- will he stop he's benjamin buttoning height wise yes like i mean but that's when and we see his inexperience with basketball that's when his game i think turn really becomes that next level because him starting as this six six almost like smaller power forward kind of guy which would honestly make him already a center power forward on navy regardless yes. because of the height requirement but he has the agility that i feel like oh a lot God. of seven footers just don't have and i th- I don't know whether to chalk it up to him being kind of shorter up until his junior year of high school or not but like when you think of big men, and like I said, he was my favorite player growing up, his ability to move his feet and how agile he was in the paint yep. was just unmatched. Like, you, I, I've seen him defend Michael Jordan before going into the paint and not like hard fouling him like those bad boy Pistons teams, but playing Real defense. actual defense and shuffling his feet putting himself between his man and the basket and even shutting him down. Yeah. Like, well, we that's talk, what's so fascinating. We talk about these guys who are decades ahead, and I feel like at, at, for his position, he was a couple of decades ahead. And, like, the NBA is not a big man league anymore. Even that being said, a player of his caliber and his skill set, some team would be like, you can still play. Yep. Like y- you will find something for you to do as good as he was. Yeah. I mean, he was just dominant and dominant in college. Do- yes. Dominant in and college. In pros, I was going to say, but he will go down as Navy's greatest player of all time. I don't think that will ever be even close to being touched for that institution. The only professional sports athlete who is even on his level is probably Roger Staubach, and that's it. That was, it it's those two and everyone else. But my thing is, he'll be the greatest basketball player because of this thing that happened. They'll because never have the another. Required. Yeah, they'll yeah, never have another any, seven footer. You're never getting any seven it's foot just, one guys. His his story is so great. But uh, he wore. Uh, I wanted to bring this up. He wore number fifty in uh, college for uh, Ralph Sampson. And for those of you who don't know, uh, Ralph Sampson was an amazing player in college at Virginia. Uh, I think he was like 7'3 or 7'4 as a center. Yep. And I'm sure he obviously watched him at UVA. And he had a great NBA career, too, for the Rockets, where him and I'll bring this up later, but him and uh, Hakeem Olajuwon were the twin towers for that finals team in 86 for the Rockets. Unfortunately, you know, a lot of big men succumbed to injuries and it kind of derailed his career. But during his time, Ralph Sampson was a fantastic dominant big man in a dominant big man era. Yes. And that was his, uh, like you said, it was his, one of his biggest influences. And that's why he took the 50 because like it was his, it was his favorite player coming up. Oh, totally. And honestly, his last two years at Navy, 
Two-time All-American, senior year, won the Naismith and Wooden Awards. And in 1986, his team in the NCAA tournament, and this is where people start to notice him. Yep. When he is, um, you know, just 20, 21 years old, they're like, wait, Navy's in the NCAA tournament? And he's taking, yeah, that's the and big thing. And they're winning games? Yes. He's and he taking takes him this, to the Elite Eight. He takes him to this, this, this Navy team that obviously doesn't have – true basketball prospects and people are looking at him like oh this guy is like beyond this what is, we think this is a unicorn this is yes. you know this is a gow and strange animal type of individual losing and to uh duke in the in the elite eight who were the national runners up that year yep i mean that's that's incredible granted they don't have the same success during his senior year but his last three years at Navy, he's averaging almost 25 points a game, over 12 rebounds, almost five blocks. That's my favorite thing, and that's this is where we get into his athleticism, is his blocking ability is so much better than like every center. He could it's move, insane. He could move. It, it's not like some fucking Leviathan like Shaq that just parks his fat ass in there. Yep. This guy moves in every area of the paint to we'll, defend we'll get into he actually hated Shaq. oh i know I that, loved that. And I, you know what fuck you Shaq. i always hated those lakers team you yeah. and that uh fuck Kobe you Shaq. Bryant i want to know how big your penis is <laughs> <laughs> will chamberlain episode 13 listen everyone we brought that one up but his field goal percentage was also good because like yes and i'll bring this up during his nba career there was no big man with a silkier smooth left-handed outside jumper like a David Robinson. He had over a 60% field goal percentage. It wasn't like he was just draining him like a shack from two feet away from the basket. Yep. He could catch a pass. He, he had a mid-range jumper for a seven-footer that was pretty much un, unseen. I mean, Hakeem had a had a a pretty good jumper, but like not even a but you know what I mean. Hakeem mid- was a dominant beast, though. But I mean yes. his and in the paint, probably a little more uh, tougher than Robinson. I mean, when he would post a guy up, Hakeem could really post a guy up. Yeah. But Robinson, I can still see him at the Alamo Dome just sinking it from the fucking corner about 15 to 18 feet away, just stroking it. Dude. Well, the other thing that I saw that a lot of people defending him said that he was so tough because he was one of the only left-handed Big men. A lot of the big men yeah. were right-handed. So like, but that also worked to his advantage. Yes. He post a guy up and go the other way. Yep. Yeah. But I mean, he and tough as nails, dude. Yes. In the paint, but like that outside shot of his was just something. You're right. Silky pretty. smooth. Just silky smooth. Dude. Yeah. And obviously, by the end of his senior year in 1987, everyone's looking at him because remember, this is you can't play zone defense in the NBA at this time. It's a center-based league yep. outside of Jordan and, you know, Bird and Magic. But, I mean, like, this is where you need that dominant center. This is the person you wait for. Yes. This is where you invest all your chips. So he's the obvious prize of the lottery. You're two years removed from Patrick Ewing and that lottery possibly being fixed. But San Antonio doesn't have, like, a really great shot at this lottery. I think they're, like, third or fourth most likely. But, I mean, they're not the team that is likely to get him. Yes. But the San Antonio Spurs, remember, we had talked about in our ABA episode, go and listen, I believe it's episode seven. They're one of the ABA teams that makes the NBA as far as being kind of absorbed and merging. And they have a really rough go of it after George Gervin leaves in the late 70s. The the early and mid 80s are not kind to the Spurs. And they need a marketable star to keep their team Reminder, this is a city like San Diego. You only have one professional sports team. Yes. And they need their star. And for whatever reason, they win the NBA draft lottery. Luckily. That that was the big thing. And this was what I thought was so interesting was David Robinson has to serve um, his naval whatever you want to is um i think it's two years it's a two-year enlistment okay. in the navy i'm roger staubach had to go through it every that's why you don't see a lot of people drafted out of service academies yes. because you're an officer you're an officer in the united states military upon graduation yes majored in math graduated in math this is he's a very smart individual no 100 percent. but this is what i thought was a great move from the spurs was because he 
they don't ha- necessarily have the rights to sign him right after they draft him because he can literally re-enlist in the draft when his... Re-enter the draft, re-enter, yes. yes. After he was a, a lieutenant it's... junior grade in the Navy and they were kind of worried like he might not receive his officer commission yep. because he's too tall and can't fit on certain uh, ships and stuff. But I remember the owner, they were asking him at the lottery because I actually saw highlights of this um, on YouTube. They were like... Do you worry at all about his two year, you know, yeah. military, whatever? And he's like, We've waited X amount of years since we've become a franchise for a championship. I think we can wait two more. Yes. And to Robinson's credit and to San Antonio's credit, they were like, Well, we don't care. And Robinson was like, Well, I was drafted by this team. That's exactly where I'm gonna go. Well, I thought it was interesting that he actually looked at other prospects. He said that LA came in. Yeah, I'm sure they did with Jerry Buss. Pretty much big markets came in and asked him what he thought about what he was going to do. And he said the first time he went to San Antonio and met the ownership group, met this team, he said it just kind of gelled like he loved the Spurs as soon as he went out there and pretty much was like, yeah, I'll sign with you. You drafted me. That's yeah. He has that kind of honor uh, in him, if that makes sense. No. And when you see him just as a person, it's like a guy like that would make a decision like that. Yes. And I mean, the guy honored two years in the United States military. That's just the type of decent individual that David Robinson is that you can't not respect. Yes. You know, well, I've, this is what is great for the Spurs of this era is David Robinson gets drafted number one overall and then doesn't play. So yeah. they, so they essentially could, tank the next year but not tank well they tank the next two years because in 88 89 they go uh i believe 21 and 61 but in the first round of the draft that year and we'll bring him up in uh maybe 1999 and uh we're located in tucson arizona for those of you listening they suck so bad that they get to draft i believe Third? third overall yeah and uh they get an individual from choya high school in the university of arizona who's uh Quite a good friend of David's and a good teammate of his, Sean Elliott. Yeah. And And this is where we see, like I was saying, you see like two stars emerge into these great teams. This is these, this was the two stars of the Spurs for the the early 90s. And they pick up Rod Strickland. They pick up Terry Cummings. They're actually building a good team again you haven't seen since the Iceman was doing his thing in the late 70s. Yeah, that's something I thought was so great. I saw an interview with both of these guys, and Sean Elliott goes, you remember our first game? Because they, they're rookies together. Yeah. They're out there together in their first game. They're playing game. their first games together, even though Robinson's probably got a good two, three years on Sean exactly. Elliott. Exactly. And he goes, our first game? And he goes, yeah, the first time we ever suited up and got on the court. And he goes... You mean against Magic and Worthy? Yeah. <laughs> and was, and it, it's such a great thing. It was just like, we were looking at each other in the middle of this, like, this is real. We're, yeah. we're in the middle of this. And it was such a great first game, I felt like, for these two, because they were just like, it, it, Robinson was like, he switched, I went out, and there was Magic just hitting one in my face. And it was just like, <laughs> damn, that's it. That's the NBA. But because they have this infusion of talent, They set the then NBA record, which will later be broken by them, as we'll get into. Yep. They go from 21 wins to 56 wins in 88-89. They go to the second round of the playoffs and then end up losing in seven games to the Blazers who won the Western Conference that year. Yep. I mean, Robinson's NBA Rookie of the Year, just an absolute stud. I mean, just an absolute awesome player yes just an that, awesome player that was what people were saying i think it was robert parish from the celtics because he was right at the end of his career yeah. and coming from navy not having so this is like five years removed from him playing his starting first, basketball yes yeah. and he said that everybody thought he was overhyped there was too much hype and then he was like I played one practice with him and I was like, oh no, no, this guy is the real. And he's just learning. Yes. Yes. (laughs) He's, he's constantly improving. Yeah. And I mean, he had Robinson had that work ethic and he made himself 
into a big man that did everything. He was an outlet passer like Wes Unseld. Yep. He could run the floor like a goddamn small forward. Like he could do everything yes. for a guy of his height and do it well. And the end of his first year, I mean, he's averaging over 24 a game, 12 rebounds, almost four blocks. Yeah. The blocking I think is one of one of his best attributes because and this is what I feel like in the era is. So if he's getting four blocks, he has to be changing so many other shots. Like he, his defensive presence for the Spurs in these in this era, right before you know Tim Duncan comes in, had to have been what drove them. Oh no! I mean, he's the engine. I mean, Sean Elliott's an All Star, great player. Terry Cummings, Rod Strickland, who was later traded, good players. Yep. Avery Johnson was a point guard on an NBA fi- or NBA Finals winning team. I mean, he has good players around him, but like he's the centerpiece. Yeah. I mean, first team All NBA ninety one ninety two, All Defensive First Team ninety two Defensive Player of the Year. He was the third player in NBA history to finish in the top ten in five categories in one year. I thought that this was is a, like yeah. Larry Bird Hall of Fame, like scoring, rebounding, blocks, steals, field goal percentage. He was on the ninety two dream team. Yep. I, I mean I, I, and, he, and he won a bronze medal when he was still a collegiate player uh in the eighty eight Olympics. I saw that. So I wanted to bring his international career up before they let professionals play. He played on the I think it was in Seoul in yeah. eighty eight. And they got a bronze. And then he said how different it was playing on the dream team. And he said, because uh, I saw I watched this interview with him and Sean Elliott. He said the ball movement on those dream teams was so insane that like everybody was so dialed in. And then what everybody says is, yeah, the hardest team you guys ever played was the other team in practice. Well, I mean, when you look at that roster, that it's is the best. I mean, granted, there were players who played before that on certain Olympic teams, yep. you know, or who didn't play in the Olympics, but that are Hall of Famers and legends and things like that. That is the greatest collection of talent that has ever been assembled, and David Robinson was part of it. Yep. I mean, that that just speaks to how awesome this guy was yeah. as far as his, you know, basketball ability. playing yeah. ability. Yeah. And the sad thing is for the Spurs and um, what was it? Uh, March of 92, Yeah, he has, uh, what was it, a hand injury. On March 16th, uh, he tore a ligament in his hand, and uh, they made the playoffs, but he was iced before game about 70 in the season, and they couldn't, you know, take it. But, like, I would say around 93 or 94 is when you see him really hitting his stride. Yeah, well, this 93-94 season is, I brought up earlier, he said – he has no problem with Shaq now. They're both, you know, retired yeah. athletes. But in the moment, he said, I hated Shaq. Yeah. Like, he was my rival. And a lot of people put his rival as Hakeem, but he, I feel like... Him and Hakeem were never animosity. That's what I... Yes, court. exactly. They, was, they had Shaq respect. Is a, Shaq has a different personality because Hakeem's, Hakeem's a lot like David in terms yes. of just being a silent assassin and being positive and yes. just being like... Yeah, I'm going to go out and kick your ass. And Enjoy that's it. what I I absolutely love about this 93-94 season was he said he hated Shaq. He was battling Shaq for the scoring Oh, leader. I love this. Oh, God. And in the final game of the season, he scores 71. To just beat Shaq because he almost averaged 30 a game in 93-94. He yep. averaged 29.8, and he scores 71. Breaking George Garvin's record. I think George had like 64 or 60, something. 63, something so, yeah. like that. Yeah. But it, it's one of those, like we said, it was just like uh, George was probably like, I never thought that record would be broke. Well, I want to bring up another game that season, which this is, is what I mean. just so more many... impressive. Be, only because it's – almost never done is in a 115 96 win over the Pistons. Yep. He has a quadruple double. I don't know the last time it was done. Well, for those of you listening, a quite like when we say double, double and Robinson and Tim Duncan are just double, double machines when they're playing together, triple, double, quadruple, double, double doubles. You know, if you're a big man of this era, double doubles are pretty easy. It's when you average double figures and, in two separate statistical categories. And it's always always for big man, it's almost always going to be points, points and, and rebounds. rebounds. And when we say triple-double, as we brought up in episode two with Magic Johnson, it's usually 
points, rebounds, and assists. Yep. Points, rebounds, maybe sometimes steals, you know. David Robinson in one game had a quadruple double, which means in four statistical categories, he had double figures in points with 34, rebounds with 10, 10 assists, and 10 blocks in a game. Yep. That is insane. Yeah. That is completely insane. And granted, the Pistons at this time um, are playing with Sean Elliott. Because they got another guy who David didn't necessarily get along with, who had a lot of negative things to say about David because they traded to Detroit for him and Dennis Rodman. Yep. And this was always a knock, and we'll keep bringing this up in a couple of other seasons as far as this episode goes. The Spurs were not even necessarily bridesmaids in the Western Conference at this time. Dennis Rodman had some disparaging things to say about David Robinson, about lacking kind of a killer instinct, that yeah. type of thing. And the Spurs were usually out in the first or second round of every playoff series that they made. Great teams, but not necessarily great enough to take on teams like Phoenix or the Sonics and Blazers and things like that. But when they get to 94-95, you think it's finally their time. Hey, everybody. Just want to take a quick break to uh, let you know that our Sports Experience podcast is brought to you by Engel Studio here, and uh, they're here in Tucson for all your recording needs. You think it's finally their time. Because... Well, off, off of the 93-94 season, you think this guy can lead a team past where, he, past where they've been ending up, which is the second round. Yeah. Like... Everybody thinks like he's really been underachieving in these playoff and this But he's the whole goddamn engine of the exactly. team. Exactly. Yeah, and he's never like a me guy. No. Which almost feeds into that narrative like uh, I don't know. Yeah. But 94-95 rolls around and I distinctly remember this season cuz this this was a hell of a lot of fun to watch. He wins the league MVP. Yep. Entire league MVP, 27.6 points a game, 10.8 rebounds, almost three assists a game over three blocks. He almost had two steals per game. I know, per game. He yeah. had just the quickest hands in the yes. paint like that. And uh, they finished with a league best 62-20 and 20 record. This is the year that Jordan plays. He comes back, but he plays like a quarter of a season. So you're thinking it's wide open. They have the number one seed in the West nobody's as good as them. I mean, they're kicking ass. You got Avery Johnson, Vinny Del Negro, Sean Elliott. I mean, you have a loaded ass team and they roll through the postseason. I mean, I remember them living in Denver, sweeping the nuggets in the first round. Yep. They go into the second round, kick the shit out of the Lakers. Unfortunately, because the sun shit the bed that year, Defending champion Houston, who had a down year and just acquired Clyde Drexler, end up with a sixth seed, and they end up in the conference finals against San Antonio. Yeah. And Hakeem Olajuwon is there. I was going to say, this is the big thing that they were saying about David Robinson pre-Tim Duncan is this meetup with Hakeem. Hakeem outplayed him and won the series. I'll be honest, though. Hakeem would have outplayed an in their prime Bill Russell and Wilt Chamberlain in this series. If he you was, go back and yes. watch it, this is like, granted, he was already on his way to the Hall of Fame before that. This just put a complete and total stamp on it. And Robinson was averaging over 20 a game in the six game series. It's just, he played, Elijah Wan just played on another level. Well, like what you were saying, when he backed a guy in, and David Robinson being one of, if not the best center, defensive center in the league at this point, when he backed the guy in, it was almost for sure he was going to nail that little hook. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like Hakeem was so deadly that it's it's. I feel like it's it's not justified talking shit on David Robinson for losing this because he was Hakeem was so good. Oh no! I mean, it was. It's it's not fair to dismiss Robinson for this series because it it just was otherworldly. Yep. Essentially. Yeah. So So they go on to win the that ninety five championship that everybody felt like the Spurs was gonna well, take. They beat Shaq's magic that year. Yep. Uh, I do remember that. Yeah. I actually was rooting for Houston because sorry, Shaq, you lost to Aaron Carter in that music video. But uh, 95, 96, uh, summer of 96, he goes to the Olympics again with Dream oh, yeah. Team 2, and he 
does win another gold medal. Um, has a great season over, you know, 25 points a game, 12 rebounds, over three blocks. But uh, they end up losing to the Jazz in six games in the second round. Yeah, and this is that. just another one of those. I was going to say that Jazz that goes to the finals that year, right? No, or, no, they did. They, lo- they lost to the Sonics. They lost to the seven. Sonics. Yeah, yeah. Sean Kemp episode, I believe, thirty-seven ish. Yeah, see, we are just tying all these back in. There you go. And then we see the ninety-seven season, which ninety-six, ninety-seven. It, it's when you see this happen to a big man. It's almost like when you see an old person break their hip. You're like, I'm no, and I can't get up. Not the back. <laughs> Well, not only does he have the back injury, but he ends up coming back for five games or something. Six games. Yeah. And he, but that year, what a lot of people don't know is not only did he miss a ton of games, Sean Elliott missed a ton of games uh, that year too. I think he missed I think the half entire the season, season yeah. or something like that. And they said they were both out like a I remember ridiculous I amount. remember watching this team and I remember and this is granted, this is an era of also Denver Nuggets basketball, which yep. was also god awful. Like where Norm McDonald was making fun of him at the ESPYs, where he's like, Ah, you know, the Broncos won the Super Bowl and uh, they had a big parade and uh you know the Nuggets uh they're gonna have a parade too when they win their tenth game this season. But uh sorry, I, I love Norm McDonald. But anyway, I was just watching him going like, Okay, well if they're both not playing, maybe you can suck because much like it happened in the 1987 draft where a decade later, yep. there is an ultimate prize at the end of the suckage rainbow. And when your two best players are out, you're thinking, man, it would be nice to see them win, but please, Jesus, let them keep losing. Yes. And this is the era that tanking wasn't so prevalent. And I feel like this happened to them, and people are like, whoa, can we sit major players and then pick up another player? Well, and it's not like they were sitting them. Not at all. Robinson and Elliott had legitimate injuries. And I'm pretty sure this was the season where, like, a geriatric Dominique Wilkins was their best player for yeah. the Spurs. Yeah, no, they had nobody. But like, I mean, outside of the, like, they needed an infusion of youth. Yep. And while they finished, I think, with the league's third or fourth worst record. Um, Robinson brought it up. Did you see his Hall of Fame speech where he was talking about it? No, I didn't. So he was inducted in 2009 to the Naismith Hall of Fame, and Tim Duncan was there, um, you know, because he's his friend and teammate. And he was saying, I remember during that lottery, you know when you pray for something and you hope it really happens? That's what I was doing for you, Tim. Because the ultimate prize, as we had brought up before, was a big man from college. Relatively new to basketball, just like Robinson, because Tim Duncan was an incredible swimmer as a youngster. Just grew like a weed. You don't see too many seven foot, seven foot one s- swimmers out there competing in the Olympics. But uh, Tim Duncan's the ultimate prize. Oddly enough, uh, abortion man uh, Rick Patino, you know him when he uh, took over the Boston Celtics? Yeah. They had two lottery picks that year. The reason he took that job was because he thought he was assured they had the worst record in the league that year Oh yeah, of Tim Duncan. That's why he wow. left Kentucky, because he thought he would get Tim Duncan for the Celtics and build a dynasty. That's ping, interesting, but that didn't happen. The ping, Spurs, pong, ping pong balls, just like in 87, didn't go their way, and the Spurs get Tim Duncan. Uh, and this is what I found so interesting in, the, uh, in his rookie season. They have that huge turnaround from 21 and 61. Set a new record. And then it, they break that record again. 36 games better. Yes. 56 and 26. And beat the Suns in the first round. Yep. Robinson has a great season. Leads the team 21.8 points a game. Duncan leads them in rebounding. Yeah. As they're, he always, uh, Robinson always calls him the best power forward. Yeah, I in love that. history. I love is, that. It's like a little jab, but it's also like, well, yeah, you're pretty fucking incredible yes tim duncan has definitely proved that over the years well and this is a testament to david robinson was when tim came in he was so excited that he pretty much took him under his wing and you didn't see that from a lot of super superstars but that's just his person and that's why i always love david robinson that was his personality he's he's a team guy and yeah first and foremost and always helpful like you remember those uh goofy edge shave gel commercials where he has them living with him but i mean that's just kind of like man this guy's really good and he can help me 
finally win a championship. Well, I think it comes back to, and he, he was talking about his father with growing up in a military kind of household and going to eventually joining the Navy that he understands what sacrificing your own personal achievements are for the greater good almost because when Tim Duncan came in, he pretty much, like you said, he leads him in rebounding. You probably wouldn't see that on another well, team with a star wing. Yeah. He's with a star like, center. And you know, maybe Shaq's teams bought him out. If, if he's hurt, maybe Shaq doesn't like someone coming in, stealing the spotlight. Exactly. Robinson just set a professional example for Tim Duncan. Not that Tim Duncan was like a wily person or who no, was no. doing any. He's quite boring, well, to be honest with you. But like he could just set an example and be like, you want to be as good as me or you want to be better than me? Do what I do. The other thing I thought was Tim Duncan would come in and he would be the backup and there would be that kind of strife. Like he wouldn't want him to be like this twin tower that they create. Well, hey, man, Ralph Sampson, we're bringing it right That's back what I around. Yep. Yeah. That's why I feel like, again, David Robinson was so ready for this. No, and it was a basically a perfect marriage because yes. it's still a big man league at this point. And while they lose to the eventual... Western Conference champions jazz in end of 97, 98, you think they're primed. And then in 98, 99, the lockout happens. Yep. Which, uh, not the most even recent NBA lockout. Yeah, I know. It's so ridiculous. So they get a shortened season. They get a 50 game season, but they win 37 out of those games. And I, I still remember watching this about mid season. They just got hot. Yep. And they never stopped. And Duncan this season goes from great player to Hall of Fame player by year two. Yes. I mean, they and just... Takes, st- it, this is something I found kind of interesting is in this second year, he almost takes the lead from Robinson. He at, does as the leading scorer. Yeah. Robinson's not the leading scorer, even though he's averaging 16 and 10 a game with almost three blocks. This is... a. It's not necessarily Duncan's team, but he's the best player on the team and everyone knows it. Yeah, well, you still have the Admiral. You yeah, know I mean, what I mean? You the still Admiral's a, the leader of the team. Still got to salute him. But you got Jaron Jackson and Mario Ellie draining threes. Avery Johnson, little general, just dishing it all over the place. That I was, mean, Yeah, that was something that I heard was Avery Johnson was one of these hugely vocal guys because David Robinson and Tim Duncan aren't necessarily vocal. Well, and you have Sean Elliott still there, too. Yep. They, him... And Johnson are the two holdovers from those teams that couldn't quite make it yes, earlier. Yes, exactly. They're, they couldn't get over that hump. They're getting, but I mean, they have Duncan coming in. They have a higher gun and Ellie. I mean, they're, it's a different team, but you still have that same kind of core. And by the time they get to the playoffs, while they lose game two in the first round to the Timberwolves, they'd win the series three to one. They just start knocking them off. I mean, they proceed the s- second round against yeah. the Lakers, sweep their ass. Conference finals against the Blazers. Game two, Sean Elliott, Tucson, Memorial Day miracle, incredible comeback. Robinson draining shots, Duncan draining shots. He has that miracle three pointer. You know, everybody's going crazy. Yep. And that was what won the series in game two because they put them up 2-0. They go back to Portland and just sweep their asses. Yes. They went 15-2 and in that postseason. They almost did the Moses Malone faux, faux, faux. Yes. Like 15-2 and in that postseason. They get to the finals against the Knicks, and they're obviously the better team. I mean, Robinson Hall of Famer. Duncan is coming into his own when the first two games at home. Granted, while they lose game three, by game five, it finally fucking happens. Yeah. It finally happens. And in that postseason, still averaged almost 10 rebounds, over 15 points a game, 12 rebounds in the deciding game five where Avery Johnson drains that shot from, from the, from corner. the corner. Yep. Because that year he was on fire as far as his like mid-range jumper. Like yep. if he could spot up, get a little bit open, man, he could do it. And they end up beating the Knicks. And he had a great quote. He had told Steve Kerr, who was a backup guard on that team, who had just come over from the Bulls, winning a championship doesn't make you a better person. It doesn't validate you, which is like the most David Robinson attitude towards everything. It's like 
they always say nice guys finish last and it's like he didn't need a championship to validate him but i mean that's just the way he thought but god how good did that feel oh i bet like yeah i love his story so just to think about that this this 98 99 championship a decade earlier he wasn't playing basketball yeah (laughs) that's the thing that always just keeps coming back do you think he would have even played basketball if he didn't grow that much no he would be in the navy yeah he would have probably he'd probably just be retiring from the navy now exactly as an engineer admiral officer probably (laughs) he might be an admiral there you go smart enough shit he got a math degree but you know you see the next three seasons from you know 99 2000 2000 2001 2001 2002 it just starts becoming duncan's team because at this point, Robinson's in his mid-30s, and most guys don't even have the longevity of this who are his height. Well, they were saying that his back injuries really started to, because the NBA seasons are pretty... 82 re- games, I mean. They really started to show wear and tear, and this was a little bit before they would rest their superstars at the end of the regular yeah. season. So well, this and Robinson always struck me as a guy who would be never, like... Yeah. I'm not going to... If I'm not hurt, if I'm not injured, yes. I'm going to keep playing... And over the next three seasons, you had that coinciding with the Lakers becoming a goddamn juggernaut and Tim Donahue cheating the Kings out of a championship. <laughs> um, you see his numbers start declining, as they would anybody in yeah, his every, position. Yeah, I was going to say everybody. He, the three seasons pres, uh, post-championship, he went from 17.8 points a game to 14.4 to 12.2. His rebounds dropped from 9.6 to 8.3. And then... It comes down to 2000, 2000, 2002, 2003, where he's at. It's his final season in the league. Yeah, he's well. This is what I thought was great was before the 2002, 2003 season. He announced it was going to be his last yeah. season, and I felt like in the locker room they were probably like, "Oh, we got to get this shit going this year." And the thing for the Spurs is at this time is. All those guys like a Jaron Jackson or a Mario Ellie or a Sean El- I mean, Sean Elliott probably still could have been playing, but he had that kidney ailment yep. that basically ended up taking him out, unfortunately. But you have this intelligent infusion of youth from Popovich in the front office because you have Manu Ginobili's guinea ass coming from Argentina, gold medal winner in the 2004 Olympics and multiple NBA champion, should be in the Hall of Fame, my paisan. Tony Parker coming from France as a late round first round pick yeah, or they, a late pick first round pick and Tim Duncan you're the big three defensive stopper and three point extraordinaire Bruce Bowen coming in Steven Jackson as a hired gun coming in just draining threes all over the place you yeah. get Steve Smith and Kevin Willis off the bench with Danny Ferry I mean this is like they're putting all their eggs I mean granted you have that youth behind you for future runs, which they end up accomplishing. Yes. But you're like, we're we making could have, it happen. Yeah. We're making it happen. We're, we're, we're getting the band back together to take that title away from that Chiba smoking douchebag Phil Jackson and the Lakers. And God damn it, they do it for the Admiral. Yeah. And that's something that I felt like when he announces he's going to retire at the end of the year and they really put this season together must have been, I don't know because I couldn't find it what he felt about it, but the second one might've been felt better than that first. Well, you know that Jackson was talking shit during that year about the Spurs about how, Oh, well that 99 championship should have an asterisk by it. Yep. Which was such both. Oh my God. I remember the signs in the stands because we'll go into this later when they play the Lakers in the playoffs, they had signs that said, kiss our asterisk. Yep. Because like, all right, you want to motivate them anymore? This is a 60, yeah. 60 and 22 first number one seed in the Western conference. Okay. We'll play that game. I mean, and Robinson has seeded a lot to Duncan as far as the stat sheet goes, because your money players 21. That's who it is. Yes. You know, he's averaging under nine a game, averaging under eight, re- just under eight rebounds a game. But Still a competent player, still a starter in the NBA, still a badass, still starting every game for you in the paint. Yes. And, and he's one of the players that you want on this team, all experience. And if you need him to step up, he can. Oh, absolutely. And that's what I thought was so great about this final season that he had. Oh, it was fantastic. And they roll into the playoffs, take care of the Suns in the opening round in yep. six games. Take care of the Lakers in the second round in six games. Really, you know, sticking it to them. Caused Phil Jackson to retire for a little bit. 
And then they go into uh, the Mavericks series because the Mavericks weren't supposed to be there at that time. They're good, but it's a young Nowitzki. You have Nash. I mean, they're a little bit before they really start hitting their stride, but they, yeah. they're, they're giving San Antonio fits. They're giving them fits in this series. And in game six, they're up by something like 20 points in the third quarter. Mm-hmm. And San Antonio takes a lot of their starters out. They take Robinson out. And then it just starts raining threes from Steven Jackson and Steve Kerr. If you've never watched this, go to YouTube and look up game six of the 2003 Western Conference Finals. It is unbelievably insane, this comeback that they have. And they go to the finals. And as we brought up in our ABA episode, I believe, it's the first all ABA finals in NBA history where they meet the New Jersey Nets. I actually brought I actually wrote that down brought up in previous podcasts. Yeah, I Did thought you that, really? yeah, <laughs> that's great. I thought it was because it's really great like we were saying with all of our merger episodes, the these teams that merge into these leagues really get the short end of the stick. Spurs being the first ABA team to win the championship and this first ABA, all ABA championship they win. Yeah, and one of the games, I think they had throwback jerseys yep. when uh, when they were playing in Jersey. And uh, Robinson had a good postseason. He had over 10 points, uh, over seven rebounds, almost two blocks, and over a steal a game. Yeah. I mean, he's, he brought it when it mattered most. And in the last game, game six. Yes, this is. Dude, I'll never forget I watching love it. this because we had just moved to Tucson. We were actually living in an apartment. Okay. And... Uh, in the final game, he had double-digit points, but he had 17 rebounds Yeah, going against the Kembe Mutombo in the paint. Him and Duncan in that game, Duncan actually almost had a quadruple double in game six of that game. Both him and Duncan out-rebounded the entire Nets team. That's crazy. I mean, just absolutely unbelievable but they he goes out on top like a john yes, Elway. That, he goes out on top i love that so much which is much deserved right yeah i mean did he need anything else to get into the hall of fame no did he even need a championship to get into the hall of fame but for him to do that and then david stern after the game to have the community service award in the nba the players getting the david robinson plaque which will go into all the great things he's done off the court Amazing. Yeah. Like, what other way would you want to go out for a guy like that? I was going to say, his story is so much the person that he is. So, like, you kind of see these other guys go through some rough stuff off the court, blah, blah, blah. It's like his basketball story mirrors his off court. Just a, I, just a good person. Just a good person. Just That's a, what I mean. It, it works out for him in the end. Like you said earlier, nice guys finish last. I just feel like this kind of just works out for him. All like it's it must have been so disheartening. Ninety six when he break or when he breaks his hand and he has this ridiculous yeah. back injury. But when Tim Duncan comes around and then they have a season together and then that next season they're just like, oh, this could like really happen. It, exactly. It yeah. must have been one of the great and. To, to further this, he said that the relationships he had with Sean Elliott, Tim Duncan, and, and eventually Popovich, he was like, those are like guys that I'm still friends with like right now. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, it. he's had a great life. He yeah. had a great career. It couldn't, And it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. That's what I love, yeah. First ballot Hall of Famer in the Olympic Hall of Fame as his own self and the dream team. Yep. Like, what else could you want? I mean, this is a guy... 10-time All-Star, two cha- two-time champion, four-time NBA first team, over 20 point, 21 points a game in his career average, over 10 rebounds. I mean, this is... Over three blocks. Over three blocks. I think he had 3.1, which I love. That's why I love he... he... And him and Duncan, after they won the championship, they were the ASI Sportsman of the Year. Yep. How great is that? The Twin Towers. God, you were my favorite player, David Robinson. You made the NBA fun to watch, which I don't watch it anymore no it's a different nba but i want to bring up just a little bit he uh his post-career yeah. charity his charity is almost unmatched by a lot of other athletes because it's, he it's is, not even touched yeah not even touched. i mean you know he started a school a yes. school system basically in san antonio yes and i saw that he's donated something like 15 million to that school and getting it started i saw recently 
that school had a huge thing with free meals because of COVID. And yeah. they were like one of the big things in San Diego or I mean, San Antonio giving out free meals. Well, him and his wife, uh, Valerie, they invested $9 million just to get the school off the ground. Yeah. And like, if you're going to give a community involvement or activism award, who the hell should it be named after? It's this guy. Yep, exactly. That's why I love. No, it's just amazing. It's uh, Carver Academy in San Antonio. Carver Academy, yes. Yeah. I saw um, this interview with him and Sean Elliott where he said, Sean, we watched that city grow, and that's why I love it so much. Because when they went there, San yeah. Antonio was, I mean, the franchise really wasn't shit this town really wasn't you know what i mean it's and the only it, team in town and he said over that next decade not only the city grew the franchise everything yeah and he was such a integral part of that i don't think it would have happened without him no to think if they don't win that lottery with him i mean not even duncan I yeah mean, that's yes duncan is a completely separate conversation yes if they don't win the lottery in 87 they're in an, that that franchise is likely in another city. Yes, that's ex yes, exactly. Even w if they get Sean Elliott, even if you know what I yeah. mean, like yeah, the the luck that they got with Robinson, and then eventually with Tunk with Duncan, almost similar which circumstances. Is, which is crazy because when you when you mark his first year in the league, I just wanted to bring this up, you know, before we get out of here. From eighty nine to ninety, up until I think maybe last year or the year before, the Spurs made the playoffs every single season outside of the year him and Elliott were hurt. Yep. Where they got Tim Duncan and then just extended it. Yes. That's unbelievable. Well, he made this franchise viable. So he didn't play on a dynasty, but he created... he paved the road for a dynasty to roll down. Oh, easily. Yeah. No, I mean... he. I don't want to say he saved that franchise, yeah. but without him, what is it? They're playing in Kansas City or something. I don't know. Hey, everybody. This is just a stock message at the end of every episode. We hope you enjoyed whatever athlete and or team that that episode was about. Just want to say give us a quick follow on all social media. We have a YouTube channel, the Sports Experience Podcast, and we're on Instagram, Totolo Dominic and myself, C. Quinn Comedy. So give us a follow all around. Um, we're always recording right here at Angle Studio. Thank you all very much. <laughs>